let us take a prayerful posture close our eyes placing ourselves in the presence of Jesus as we breathe in let us breathe in his tender love and as we breathe out repeat slowly Jesus I trust in you
let us gently open our eyes and behold Jesus he says do not be afraid I am the living one I was dead and now look I am alive forever and ever and I hold the keys of death and Hades dear friends if in the last session we contemplated with Mary the one whom they have pierced today with her let us contemplate the greatest event in human history the resurrection not merely as a historical fact nor as a great miracle not even just as Jesus glorious presence amongst us dear friends what we are contemplating is the beginning of the new creation human life and in fact the whole of creation is already being renewed transformed and glorified behold I make all things new do you not perceive it the grace we seek as we contemplate this mystery is freedom from the past freedom to think new thoughts freedom to walk new paths freedom to step out into the unlimited possibilities of believing that Jesus is risen behold he walks with us he goes ahead of us early on the first day of the week while it was still dark Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance so she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple the one Jesus loved and said they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped round Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. Now Mary stood outside the tomb, crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned round and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, Woman, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned towards him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabuni, which means teacher. Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord! And she told them that he had said these things to her. Here are five reasons to believe the resurrection of Jesus actually happened. One, 
the empty tomb. Something happened to the body of Jesus. He was crucified by the Romans, buried, and three days later a few women discovered an empty tomb. The place of his burial was publicly known, and if the crowds and religious leaders could have produced a body, they would have. Something happened. Two, a lot of people in the first century believed they saw and interacted with Jesus after his death. Paul claims that Jesus appeared to dozens and once to over 500 people, and then challenges his first century readers that if they don't believe him, there are plenty of other people who were there. Go ask them. Three, after his crucifixion, Jesus' friends ran away terrified and hid. These were not bold men. But all but one of Jesus' disciples ended up dying horrible deaths for their belief. They gained nothing for preaching this message of a resurrected king. They lost their families, their jobs, reputations, and became hated and hunted by all. What transformed them into fearless preachers of this radical message? Would you die for something you knew was a lie? Reason number four, James and Paul. James went from being Jesus' skeptic half-brother to a leader in the church because he said he talked with his resurrected brother. How could anyone go from thinking their family member was crazy to believing they are God? And he was eventually thrown off the roof of the temple for his faith. I trust James as a witness to the resurrection. And Paul, a Pharisee, a Jewish religious leader who hated Jesus and his followers. He arrested and stoned Christians. Then he said he met the resurrected Jesus and devoted the rest of his life to preaching the forgiveness of sins in Jesus' name. Thirteen letters, about 30% of the New Testament, was written by him, and he was eventually beheaded for his faith. I trust Paul as a witness to the resurrection. Five. The simple message of the gospel has changed the world. Humans cannot work their way to God, but the good news is that God himself has come to save us. Jesus took on flesh and lived among us. His life, his death, and his resurrection is our only hope. And if Jesus humbled himself, then so should we. Christians are called to love and serve all people. This Jesus, who never led an army, never wrote a book, never had a family, never owned a home, who died a criminal's death as he was abandoned by his friends, has for 2,000 years single-handedly inspired billions to build hospitals, start orphanages, lead in disaster relief, medical research, scientific discovery, to create beautiful works of art, and the list goes on and on. This is all hard to explain if Jesus stayed dead. The best explanation for these five facts is that Jesus did, in fact, rise from the dead, validating his claim to be God. Let us seek Jesus with the passionate love of Mary Magdalene. Let us allow him to enter into our closed hearts with peace, to breathe upon us the gift of the Holy Spirit, freedom to forgive the past, the people around us, let us allow him to walk with us from the Emmaus of our despair into the new Jerusalem of hope, the new creation. I am making all things new. Let us touch Jesus, his sacred heart, like St. Thomas, and be transformed into flames of love. What manner of communications are these that ye have one to another? As ye walk and us, sad. Art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem and hast not known of the things which are come to pass there in these days? What things? Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and have crucified him. But we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. And beside all this, today is the third day since these things were done. Yea, and certain women 
also of our company, made us astonished, which were early at the sepulchre. When they found not his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels, which said that he was alive. And certain of them which were with us went to the sepulchre and found it even so as the women had said. But him they saw not. O oh, fools, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. for thanks for thy bounties. Amen. Amen. Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way and while he opened to us the scriptures? We must return to Jerusalem this very hour. Luke 24. And I must admit, it is my single favorite story in the entire Bible. The story of Clopas and his companion who meet up with the resurrected Lord but don't recognize him. And they spend hours walking mile after mile with the Lord. And of course, he opens up the scriptures and their hearts are burning within them, but their eyes aren't open until what happens. Well, you know, when they arrive at the village of Emmaus, they're there at the table and he does something. He does four things. He takes the, the bread, he takes it, he blesses it, he breaks it, and he gives it to them. It's the same sequence of four actions in Luke 24 that you find in Luke 22 on Holy Thursday in the upper room. When he takes, he blesses, he breaks, and he gives the bread to the 12 disciples. And of course, this is the moment of grace. This is the occasion of revelation. This is when Christ's resurrected body is unveiled, but it's not a flashback because Clopas and his companion weren't numbered among the 12. They weren't in the upper room for that final Passover. Instead, this is a reminder to us of how it is that the law and the prophets are pointing forward to Christ and that Christ's death and resurrection is the fulfillment of everything that we find in the law and the prophets. But that fulfillment didn't end when he came out of the tomb. The fulfillment is really alive in the Holy Eucharist. When Jesus takes, blesses, breaks, and gives to us that bread of life, and we recognize through the eyes of faith that this is his body, blood, soul, and divinity. Our eyes are opened in the breaking of the bread to the reality of Christ's resurrected body. It's the same body that was in the upper room on Thursday night. It's the same body that was hanging on the cross on Good Friday. It's the same body that was buried on Holy Saturday. But what has happened on Easter Sunday is that this body of Christ is transfigured. His humanity is deified. But it's not just resurrected and deified. It turns around and he deifies us by empowering us through the Holy Spirit to endure our suffering and to face the hour of our death and to enter into the joy and the glory of his resurrection. This is who we are as Catholics, and this is why we celebrate Easter, and it's why it isn't over and done in a day. Easter Sunday becomes an octave, and really, we are an Easter people, and hallelujah is our cry. Children, 
Easter is the miracle of God's love working through human brokenness and weaknesses. It is the power of God bursting asunder human bondages and our chains. It is the beginning of the new creation. For anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. Am I still unduly disturbed by my past? Do I confidently leave them to his forgiving love and mercy? Is my hope in the risen Lord real, strong and unshakable? There can be no resurrection without crucifixion. Submitting to his will, do I accept the sufferings and difficulties the Lord sends me? Bring up the fish which you have now caught. Come and dine. Dear friends, our faith in the resurrection of Jesus is an invitation to move from our comfort zones into the courage zone of letting Jesus act in us as we trust him lovingly. Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? The risen Lord tells Peter near the lake of Tiberius, Now let me put a cord of love around you and lead you. Let me transform you truly into a genuine fisher of men, into what my Father created you to be. The risen Lord continues his work of recreating his people, restoring them to their original image, original innocence. Feed my sheep. Simon. He led Don Bosco from being a mere chaplain in the hostel of Marcionus Barola to the streets of Turin to be a father to thousands of young people, to be a good shepherd after the heart of Jesus. He led a Mother Teresa from merely being a principal in a Loreto convent to the streets of Kolkata to be an angel of mercy, a carrier of God's tender love. The risen Lord wants to do something new in you. He wants to transform you to be what God has created you to be. I unto thee, when thou wast young, thou girdst thyself and walkst whither thou wouldst. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall gird thee and carry thee whither thou wouldst not. What is one thing you are not venturing into because of fear? What is a mission you are not taking up because of your mindset? Do you truly believe in the resurrection of Jesus? Follow me. Do you truly believe that he is alive, he is with you? Jesus invites you. Lord. Come, let me act in you. Trust me lovingly. If I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Follow them me. It's a cold and foggy winter morning, and I'm standing on the world's tallest bungee platform. The platform I'm standing on is so tiny that I have to stand on my toes and balance myself against the wind. The operator ties one end of the bungee cord to my ankle and throws a slack in the air. I can feel the weight of the rope on my ankle slowly dragging me down. I look down. All the buildings and roads are buried in heavy fog. There is only one voice in my head. I can't do this. So I turn around and tell them that I want to quit. 
And then I see a huge quote printed on the glass window right next to me. Life begins at the edge of your comfort zone. I don't know why, but this short yet powerful sentence gives me the final push. And before I realize it, I walk straight back to the platform and jump off the world's highest bungee platform. During the five seconds of free fall, I remember thinking to myself, "It's not as scary as it looks." <laughs> And that thought led to a whole new world. Every time I hear the voice of fear in my head, I can't leave this job because I'm not going to find anything better. I'm scared of entering a new relationship because I don't want to be hurt again. And even a minute ago, before I walked onto the stage, the voice was repeating in my head. Every time I hear that voice, I take a deep breath and tell myself it's never as scary as it looks. Let me take you back to the summer of 2007, a remote village in Cambodia, a small room in the domestic violence victim center. It's my first day of work. I walked into the room and was introduced to an 18-year-old girl. Her name was Chia. Chia was so emotionally and physically abused that she was trembling all the time, and she couldn't even look at me in the eyes. And on her face, I saw fear, anxiety, and shame. And that day, Chia refused to take our help and went back to her husband. And in the course of next few months, she would do that again and again, only come back with more bruises and cuts. Chia knew that she should leave her husband, but she was scared to because she had been married to her him since 14, depending on him for survival, and did not know that she could live a life on her own. To help Chia, and thousands of other girls like Chia, I started a vocational skill training program. After three months of training, magic happened. She regained confidence and dignity, stepped out of the fear of failure, found a new job in a local hotel, and separated with her husband. She started a new chapter of life at the edge of her comfort zone. She might be an extreme example, but I can see myself in her, and maybe you can too. What is it that you're not doing because of fear of failure? Finding a new job, starting a new company, or asking someone out for a date. For me, it was the fear of public speaking. Whatever it is, I encourage you to try it because, as Chia found and I found, and I think you will find too, it's never as scary as it looks, and you're stronger and more capable than you thought. The second story is about embracing uncertainty. My friend Zhang lives an extremely comfortable life in Hong Kong. He works from nine to five and receives a very good pay. But he's dispassionate about his job and life, and he's constantly complaining. He has lived his whole life with certainty that the fear of losing what he had is stopping him from pursuing his passion. Until one morning, I got a call from him. Hi, Yuvin. I went to a positive psychology class last quarter. Got so inspired, I quit my job today and I'm moving to Australia. <laughs> you what? What are you going to do with your life? I asked. He said, "This is the first time in life that I don't have a plan, and I feel every bit as scared as I'm excited." The next time I saw him was six months later. He just got back from Australia, a licensed hypnotherapist, from a trader to a hypnotherapist. <laughs> I was shocked when I saw him again. His face was pink, eyes glittering, his whole body was just glowing. He is living his dream right now, traveling around the world, giving workshops and therapy sessions for thousands of people to find happiness in life. And as with Chia, I could see myself in Zhang, and maybe you can too. We're all scared of uncertainty. Giving up all you have to pursue a dream that may or may not work out. Loving someone with whole heart without guarantee—it's incredibly hard. But as John found, and I found, and I think you will find too, it's never as scary as it looks, 
and it leads to more possibilities and happiness in life. The last story is about vulnerability, and the last story is about me. My love for my parents is the strongest emotion in my life, but in Asian culture, love is seldom expressed in words. It makes me feel extremely uncomfortable to tell them I love you or to even share my feelings with them. Our daily conversation is a combination of what I had for lunch and what they had for dinner. <laughs> The word courage came from Latin root cur, which means heart. And the original meaning of courage is to tell the story of who you are with your whole heart. I don't know why I have the courage to stand here today and share my story with you, but I don't have the courage to tell my parents I love you. They raised me with love, so much love. They made me believe I'm worthy of love, not because of what I achieve, but because of who I am. Yet I so desperately want to be this perfect child for them. I share my happiness and achievements. And withhold my struggles and failures. And as I'm proud of my achievements, I didn't know that this created a huge emotional gap between us, and we no longer share the joy and pain of each other's life journey. I've been experiencing a tough time recently: a heartbroken ending of three-year relationship, many questions about friendship. And deep insecurity about future. A couple of weeks ago, I came back from an exhausting recruiting trip from New York. The moment I walked in my room in darkness, I experienced an emotional breakdown. I called my mom, and burst into tears the moment I heard her voice. And for the next hour and the first time in my life, I shared my struggles with her. And even though she hasn't been with me in this journey for so long, she understands exactly what I've been going through. The feeling of reconnection after so many years is like magic. In the end, I told her I love you, and she said I love you too. It's the first time I remember either of us has said that. I didn't expect what felt so uncomfortable previously came so natural. And peacefully, in the end, I see life as a constant fight against your comfort zone. You push it; it pushes back. What's the fear that's holding you back? What are you not saying or doing because it's outside your comfort zone? I challenge you to find that comfort zone today. Bravely step out of it, and as you get comfortable again. Push it even further. Don't try to get rid of fear. Accept that you will be afraid, and then go do it anyway. Life begins at the edge of your comfort zone. Every flower, every tree. One pair of hands on the valleys, the ocean, the rivers, and the sand. Those hands are so strong. So when life goes wrong, put your faith into one pair of hands. One pair of hands heal the sick. One pair of hands raise the dead. One pair of hands calm the raging storm. 
And thousands of people were fed On her hands said I love you And those hands were nailed to a tree 